So let's see what the servants of the Omnissiah have in store for them in Warzone Charadon, the Book of Rost. In this video we're going to be talking Adeptus Mechanicus and Imperial Knights. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics for the first of a few videos covering Warzone Charadon, the Book of Rost. Now Games Workshop has given us an absolute deluge of new 40k rules content this weekend, so first up I thought we'd talk about Mechanicus and Knights, then in videos later today, hopefully we'll talk about the Terminus Est Assault Force and the Drakari Court of Strife. Then tomorrow we'll talk about Games Workshop's rules previews, and I'll try and get out a full review of the Drakari Codex if I have chance. With all that being said, today we're going to look at the Mechanicus Defense Cohort, the Admic Metallica Supplement, the Imperial Knight Freeblade Lance, and also the House Raven Supplement for Imperial Knights. Without further ado, let's jump straight into it. So the match play rules in Warzone Charadon are split into Armies of Renown and Codex Supplements. Armies of Renown are basically zero command point formations, where the units in do get some powerful bonuses, but at the expense of giving up really quite a lot of options within their Codex. At the moment at least, it doesn't look like Games Workshop has massively dropped the ball with these, you do have to give up quite a lot for the benefits that you get. The first of these Armies of Renown is the Mechanicus Defense Cohort for Adeptus Mechanicus. Now the restrictions on this one are really quite severe. Your whole army must be Ammech, it must be from the same Forge world, and you can't include any Skitari units whatsoever. That's pretty unfortunate, as Skitari units include most of the Codex, you're literally only limited to Castellan Robots, Cataphron Breaches and Destroyers, Servitors, Electro Priests and Tech Priests. I was honestly a bit surprised at just what did have the Skitari tag when I was looking through. Even the transports such as the Scorpius Dune Riders, Taraxi units and Archaeopters all are Skitari, so you can't take them in this. It's particularly unfortunate for those Electro Priests, who aren't going to be able to get access to their favourite transport. On top of that, when you're taking this army, the Castellans, Servitors and Cataphrons all change out their Forge World Dogma for the Extremist Sentinels rule. It makes it quite a lot less strong than I thought it was going to be. I thought we'd be able to stack a Forge World Dogma with these excellent core benefits of Extremist Sentinels. So in terms of raw strength, it's not that great that you can't stack it with, say, those Arc Rifle Cataphrons that have the amazing Arc Shots. I believe that you still do keep your Forge World keyword though, so you should be able to gain your Forge World unique canticles, such as the one for Mars that increases the strength of weapons. So what do you get for Extremist Sentinels then, the benefit for taking this army? First of all, the army does get access to a Warlord trait, Relic and Stratagems, but the actual core benefits that are on all the time are only for those Extremist Sentinels units, and the most helpful one is minus one damage against ranged attacks, though you do have to have all models in the unit, either within your deployment zone, or within 3 inches of an objective marker. So they are going to be excessively tanky against ranged attacks whenever they're in the backfield, or taking those objectives, but won't really get any benefits against range anywhere else. Otherwise, when they're charged, they can also choose to hold steady or set to defend, much in the same way that you'd get if you were defending defensible cover, which means that you either have the choice of plus 1 to hit in melee with your units, or a 5 plus overwatch, both of which are good. It could be very intimidating to charge a big unit of Castellans with 5 plus Overwatch, and the same for Cataphron Breachers or Destroyers. Really, I think that the minus 1 damage is the main reason to take this formation though. It's going to mean that your gun line, which is already pretty hard hitting for being Admech, is just going to be really hard to shoot down. Damage 3 weapons are going to be crap against your Cataphrons, and Castellans will really like the defense increase as well, seeing as they only have 6 wounds, though some very heavy firepower per model. In terms of the other benefits, you have the option of a new Warlord trait, which is called Cacophonous Leadership. This is a 6 inch aura of obsec for any units, and it does look like it includes things like Tech Priests or Electro Priests in that, not just Extremist Sentinels. Extremist Sentinels do count as 2 models though as well, so it's going to make units like Cataphrons that bit better at securing objectives. Honestly that could be quite a helpful one, seeing as you're not going to have all that many options in terms of securing objectives in this. The Relic we saw previewed on Warhammer Community, it's called Forgefire, it's a Volkite Blaster with 36 inch range, Heavy 3, Strength 6, AP-2 and a flat damage of 2. It's not absolutely amazing, but a solid upgrade on the standard, and it will add up to a fair few more dead enemies over the course of the game. Finally we have 4 Stratagems, either 2 or 3 command points for Citation of Ruin, which again I think is one of the best benefits of the formation. It essentially gives your models the big guns never tire rule, as per vehicle rules in the core book. It means that you can fire your weapons in combat, and you don't get the minus one to hit if they happen to be heavy weapons either. Not firing at minus one to hit will be pretty nice for Castellans, though I think perhaps the biggest benefit is being able to shoot with Cataphrons in combat. It could be pretty frustrating to have your big breach or destroyer units tagged by an enemy unit, 
and this way you can just fry them with heavy firepower at close range. A little bit on the pricey side though if you are using it with big units. Next we have 1 CP for pre-calibrated purge solution, that's plus 1 to hit if you're within your own deployment zone and targeting an enemy unit that's entirely within their deployment zone. Again with Castellans and Cataphrons around you can get some really big units, so for just 1 CP you could be getting a significant amount more firepower. For 2 CP we have Bolter Defences, you select one bit of area terrain in your deployment zone, that gives you plus 1 to your cover save essentially giving it light cover if it didn't already have it, and if it did already have light cover, you could have some really tanky cover saves with plus 2 to your save. It'd be a complete nightmare to shoot down breaches with essentially a 1 plus armour save. Finally, we've got an orbital bombardment style stratagem, 3 CP for rad bombardment, you select a point on the battlefield, and then you have to wait till the next command phase to do any damage. If your opponent's units haven't all scurried off and hidden, then each one within 6 inches of that point will get d3 mortal wounds on the roll of a 4 plus, and if you roll a 6 they also get minus 1 toughness for a turn. I'm a bit on the fence about these, potentially could be really disruptive in the right situation against a slow moving army, but that's a lot of command points to be throwing into mortal wounds that your opponent could potentially mitigate fairly easily. Overall I think this formation is going to give you a slightly weird skewed gunline admec list, and it is a shame that you have to give up your forge world dogma for it. I think it could be interesting having a play around with, it's certainly going to make your units absolutely crazily tanky against ranged firepower, but I would worry whether you're actually going to be able to take and hold objectives in the midfield, as the units that you get in the detachment are fairly slow, and they're not all that amazing in close combat either, besides the Electro Priest, who'd far prefer to have a transport to roll around in. If you do match up against an enemy gun line though, you might well win those firefights, potentially army wide minus one damage for a turn or two is just a really good benefit. I guess for those people who have acquired quite a lot of Cataphron Breaches, it might not even be the hardest list to run either. Next up we're staying with the Mechanicus, and we're looking at the Metallica supplements. Metallica is the Forge World that's come under attack in this book, and in the background they're the Noisy Forge World, an entire planet made essentially of metal, and are famed for their deafening, leadership breaking assaults. Their dogma currently isn't the strongest I think, when they advance they ignore the penalty for firing assault weapons, and treat rapid fire weapons as assault weapons until the end of the turn. It's just a little bit on the niche side compared with some of the other very good ones, most of the rest were considered more competitive, whether that studies with their pre-game movement and shroud protocols, Mars with their excellent dogma for extra strength on weapons, or Lucius with their buffs to invul saves. It is interesting to see them get a big boost like this, they've certainly got more options than basically any other Forge world now. So in this mini supplement we get 3 warlord traits, 4 relics, and 8 stratagems. Starting with the warlord traits we have Master Annihilator, one unit within 6 inches gets an extra 6 inch range and plus 1 strength with radium weapons, which is pretty much tailored to be used on a very big unit of Vanguard. 24 inches and strength 4 across all of those shots is certainly going to leave a mark, and I guess that could be a reasonable pick up either to take or to buy in with the Mechanicus Locum trait if you are running multiple big units. Ash Runner gives you plus 3 inches movement and plus 1 strength, a bit rubbish in my opinion, characters can often just advance if they really need the extra movement and still provide their buffs, and perhaps the most interesting one is Radioactive Emanation, where units within 6 inches have minus 1 to their toughness, though this doesn't stack with anything else such as Rad Saturation. Honestly of the 3 I think that this one is pretty massive, we've seen just how much of a damage buff it can be when Death Guard get minus 1 toughness on the enemy, so now you can have it for Admech and open fire with all the power of an Admech gun line against an enemy unit that's minus 1 toughness. Obviously I think the biggest risk is getting the character within range of the enemy, but maybe something like a Manipulus or an Engine Seer jumping out of a Dune Rider could be a decent way to deploy this. I think this might be one of the stronger Admech Warlord traits now, as aside from the Holy Order ones the rest aren't really up to that much. Relics wise we have the Omni Sterilizer, this is a boosted eradication ray, 24 inches, strength 6, AP minus 4, damage 3 and blast, another small but meaningful damage boost there, though not particularly exciting. We've got the Bionics of Veneration, that gives the bearer a 4 plus invul save, and a 3 inch aura of enemy units being minus 1 to hit, so it could help them out in combat. The Delta Pistol, which is a Relic Gamma Pistol for those data smiths, this one actually makes them a genuine threat at strength 10, AP minus 4 and damage 4, and on top of that they also reroll wound rolls against vehicles. Perhaps the biggest downside of that one is that you needed to roll a 3 plus to hit, so it's still going to miss quite a bit of the time, but nevertheless those stats are quite fun and crazy. Last but not least we have the Metallican Lung, that's a 3 inch aura where you can reroll wound rolls against one enemy unit that's affected. That seems like it could stack really quite well with radioactive emanation, 
so you could take that and the metallic and lung on the same aggressive character, aim to stand them right by an enemy unit, and then that enemy unit will be almost comically easy to wound, minus one toughness against your guns, and also you get to reroll wound rolls against them. I think out of a lot of them, that could probably be the best combo, and it could make really big tough things like Death Guard Terminators perhaps, just that bit easier to chew through. Finally, we come on to their 8 stratagems, and first up we have 2 CP for rad oversaturation. That's another way of getting more minus 1 toughness goodness. It makes one of the Skitari Vanguard units rad saturation ability go to 6 inches rather than 1. So again, that could be used on the fly to try and make an enemy unit minus 1 toughness and easy to gun down. This one could definitely have good yields, and I guess you can choose whether or not you deploy it either as a warlord trait or with this stratagem. Next we have 1 CP for March to War, which automatically advances you through 6 inches. Going to be a bit pointless quite a lot of the time, but it could be quite interesting in some cases. I think that rules as written this would work on Cataphrons, they usually only advance D3 inches, so getting all the way up to 6 inches on a single advance is really quite a big deal. If they absolutely need to rock it over to get an objective, then this could be great. Next we have Purity of the Machine, 1 or 2 command points depending on whether it's a vehicle or not, and that can counter enemy debuffs. If you're minus 1 to hit, then you can ignore it for 1 CP, or 2 CP if you're a vehicle. Again, interesting on any big shooting unit, whether that's Corpus Cari Electro Priest with all of those shots, Cataphrons or one sort of another. Most of the time I don't think it's going to be worth it on vehicles, but again, could certainly be worth it on a huge unit of Castellans. Next for 1 CP, we have Order in Anarchy. This is plus 1 to hit versus an enemy unit that's within 12 inches, and that can work on shooting and melee. Again, a potentially powerful buff when you can use it on massive admech shooting units, and could be interesting if you can make use of it in two different phases as well, say maybe with those Corpus Cari Electro Priests, hitting very accurately both at range and when they charge in. For 3 CP, we have Extinction Order. You have to have a piece of area terrain that's visible to the Warlord, and units within 6 inches get plus 1 to wound against any enemies wholly within that area terrain. Now plus 1 to wound is a really powerful offensive buff, but 3 command points is an absolutely whopping investment, and I'm not sure this is going to be used all that much. It just seems very situational, and I have a very high price tag when you do. Next we have Knight of the Iron Cog, a really upgraded version of the Knight of the Cog stratagem from the core Admech Codex, and this for just 1 CP allows a House Raven Knight to gain a Canticles of the Omnissiah the entire game. That's a really significant buff when you're applying that to a Knight to be honest, Shroud Psalm can put you in cover, and he can get reroll ones to hit in the shooting phase. It's really quite a big reward for allying in a Raven Knight, and as we'll see in a second, the Raven Knights do seem to be quite interesting now. They are one of the ones with a whole brand new supplement. They also gain the Admet keyword for army construction rules, so if and when Canticles of the Omnissiah eventually goes to being only for pure Admet armies, the Knights won't break that, and it makes me wonder whether you could include a Knight alongside the Mechanicus Defense Cohort. I'm afraid I've not had enough chance to look into the exact wording of that yet, but that one stipulates every unit must be Adeptus Mechanicus and not Skitari, so I think it would satisfy it. Please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong though. Next we have Omnicide Exaltation, that's minus one leadership for a unit within six inches, kind of underwhelming for the most part I think. And then perhaps one of the best stratagems on the entire list, which is Blaring Glory. For one command point, your very noisy Metallica charge can distract the enemy, and you use it either in the opponent's shooting phase or in either player's fight phase, and that unit can't use any rerolls to hit or wound. If your opponent's got some massive Death Star unit with some powerful rerolls, then this could be absolutely amazing. If they move up right close to you to get a close charge as well as wanting to shoot, then they're not going to be doing it quite as effectively. This one could really mess with your opponent's head, wanting to keep you away from your Metallica units if they want to have full rerolls, and that could be really quite annoying for unit positioning. As the Admech player, you could just see whenever you have the opportunity to use this, and weigh up whether it's worth it. A very nice stratagem to have indeed, and it certainly makes Metallica more worth playing, I think. So overall, I think Metallica really is the choice as to whether or not all of these extra options really outweighs having a very underwhelming, unique doctrine, and a canticle that's okay, though not absolutely game-breaking or always going to be useful. Out of this, I think my favourite things are the pieces that you could get, like the Radioactive Emanation and Metallic and Long, to make all of your gunline units extra effective against one unit next to your Warlord, Rad Oversaturation for minus one toughness, Blaring Glory for ignoring some rerolls, and plenty of other pretty helpful situational stratagems, such as Purity of the Machine and Order in Anarchy. It'll be interesting to see how many people adopt Metallica as a Forge World when they're playing in tournaments. Moving on to the Knights then, let's talk about our Free Blade Lance and our House Raven Supplement. Now the Free Blade Lance is one of these armies of renown, so fairly punishing army construction rules, 
All your units have to be Imperial Knights, and all of them must be free blades. Imperial Knights often do function a bit better with allies rather than pure, as they struggle to contain objectives or do other useful things like actions or screening. And everyone being a free blade really isn't helpful either, you're giving up some really powerful options in the Knight households. The free blade qualities can be pretty tame, and the burdens can potentially be really quite annoying at the wrong moment. The benefits that you get through running a free blade lance though with all of these restrictions are that all the units in the army will get qualities and burdens, not just one per detachment as is normal per the free blade rules, though you do have the limitation on that that you have to pick each quality and burden once before you can start repeating them. As far as I can tell though, after you've got all of them once, you can have as many of the same ones as you like, so you could have potentially a lot of the worst ones on armagers and save the really good ones for big Dominus and Questor pattern knights. Furthermore, anyone who is a character gains the legendary knight ability, and he can potentially make multiple knights characters by giving them relics and warboard traits with pre-game stratagems. It basically means that all of your big knights should be getting plus one leadership, and they also get to select two qualities and one burden from the list. Quite nice that you don't have to roll them randomly or anything. It means that your free blade knights should have the best pick of the good qualities and get to choose the least damaging burden. There are a few handy ones out of the qualities. You can potentially get a reroll each battle round, gain obsec, which is pretty helpful for imperial knights, or the mysterious guardian one to give them an extra long heroic intervention. The plus one leadership is pretty handy when you have burdens as well, as it means that they're a lot less likely to apply. Of course, with the Army of Renown, you also get access to a few other bits and bobs. Their unique warlord trait is Echoes from the Past, and you gain a household tradition, which can be quite a good one, such as Krast or Tyrannis. Tyrannis could give you a nice 6 plus feel no pain type save, a little bit of extra durability, and Krast can give you some nice rerolls to hit in melee. Their relic is called the Bringer of Justice, which is a relic Reaper Chainsword. It goes all the way up to strength 16, so you'll be wounding other knights on a 2, and AP minus 4 as well. In addition, you also get a sweep attack, where you're striking at strength user, AP minus 3, and damage 2, and you get double the attacks out of it. However, that sort of does compete quite strongly against the stompy feet of the knight, as you get 3 attacks with the stompy feet, often I think it's going to make more sense to strike with them than this. The household tradition trait could be pretty handy, I'm a bit less convinced about the bringer of justice. Stratagems wise, you get 4. The first one is brothers and sisters and burden, and free blades within 6 inches don't have to test for their burden that turn. I guess if you want to absolutely make sure that they don't mess up early, then that could be handy. Though you would have quite a low chance of them failing anyway, if the big ones do have plus one leadership. Next we have one that's one or two command points, and I think is really quite potent. This one's strength from exile, and you can only use it if you're 12 inches away or more from any other friendly models. You can use it either in the shooting phase or in the fight phase, and you get to reroll ones to hit and to wound with all your attacks. That is really quite a significant damage buff, it's over an extra third of damage, and when you can get that for one command point on a big knight, it is not too bad at all. It does cost a little bit more at two command points though, if you use it on the really big Acastus or Dominus class knights. Next we have Deed of Legend for one CP. If you manage to kill a vehicle, monster or character, then you can gain an extra quality immediately that you didn't have before. Even if you've already picked some of the best ones, things like those extra rerolls from Legendary Hero, or Peerless Warrior for an extra random buff could always be good, though I think it's fairly fair for the cost for 1 CP, and it's kind of hard to activate. And finally we have 2 command points for Favoured Knight, that allows you to take a second relic on the same knight. Quite a big investment when usually you're only going to be paying 1 extra for a relic, but this one does allow you some pretty interesting combinations. You could potentially have something like a really strong offensive and defensive relic on the same knight, Maybe say for example a knight gallant with a paragon gauntlet and also a 2 plus armor save. You could make a knight far more threatening and your opponent want to shoot it more, and then you can give it a defensive buff as well. I think that one could certainly see some interesting builds. Overall though, I'm still not 100% convinced that it's really going to be worth running an entire imperial knight army and entirely of free blades. Perhaps for me the most interesting options are being able to get those rerolls just for 1 CP. Have the option to buy a second relic on the knight if you need it. And overall, it'll just give you a very different flavour in an Imperial Knight's army, so it could be a bit more fun if you are just looking for a different way to change it up with your knights. Finally for this video, we come to Imperial Knight's The House Raven supplement. Now, House Raven was already one of the more interesting ones in my opinion. All your knights can advance and shoot for no penalty, so they're really quite mobile. And if you did happen to bring a Castellan Knight along, they get that absolutely excellent Order of Companions stratagem for four rerolls of one to hit, wound, and damage. Gaining 3 Warlord Traits, 4 Relics and 8 Stratagems is certainly going to give them a boost. Our Warlord Traits are Lord of the Trials, which means in melee that unmodified 6s to hit will auto-wound the enemy. 
I think it's okay to be honest, though with Imperial Knights with having really high strength, a lot of their attacks will be just wounding anyway. I can't say that it's one of my favourite ones to be honest. And Violet will give you a 4 plus feel no pain versus mortal wounds, really really powerful against them, and if you do know that you're fighting a lot of Death Guard, Thousand Sons or Grey Knights, could be worth it, but otherwise not the best take all comers option. Finally, if you are allying with Metallica and getting that Knight of the Iron Cog ability, you can have Blessed by Metallica, and that one gives you plus 2 wounds, and you can be repaired by a Metallica Tech Priest as if they were a Metallica vehicle. So that's a full D3 wound regeneration, which could be pretty handy stacked with their Mechanicus ones that they already get. I wouldn't say that any of those Warlord traits are really stand out though, compared with Ion Bulwark with a 4 plus Invul. Relics wise, we have 4. First we have Relentless Wrath, which is a battle cannon with 72 inches, 2d6 shots, strength 8, AP minus 2, and flat damage 3. Can't really argue with this, it's a flat 1 damage upgrade all game long, and you don't have to spend command points every turn on it, which you'd have to do with the battle cannon stratagem. Definitely a solid option for a paladin or a crusader. Next we have Metallic and Eye, which makes your AP minus 1 better whenever you're targeting vehicles or monsters. Likely best on anything that doesn't have tons of AP, Maybe with a Battle Cannon and Gatling Cannon Knight, perhaps. We have Fury of the Keep, which is a Relic Thermal Cannon. It's Strength 9, AP-5, and Damage D6 plus 2. So it basically replaces the old Melter rules, and makes it so you're essentially always in Melter range. You do have the potential to roll very, very high with this one. On average, it spits out around about 8 or 9 damage against a standard vehicle, which is pretty crazy just in itself. But of course, it has the ability to roll really, really high if you get a bit lucky. Finally, we have Spirit of Colossi, which allows you to reroll one hit, wound, or damage roll every time you attack, whether that's the shoot or fight phase. Again, it's pretty solid. For this one, though, I think you really want something that's absolutely monstrous in terms of power. Maybe something like a Knight Errant with a Thermal Cannon, or something like a Reaper Chainsword in melee. Quite nice that they give damage rerolls as an option. That's really quite a powerful one. Overall, out of those relics, though, I think that Relentless Wrath and Fury of the Keep, the boosted Battle Cannon and Thermal Cannon, are probably the picks of them. Flat 3 damage all game long is pretty handy when there's all sorts of Gravis armour and Death Guard running around, and the Fury of the Keep is just going to delete vehicles like No Tomorrow. Finally, we come on to the 8 stratagems of House Raven. The first 3 all cost either 1 or 2 command points, but then 3 CP if you use them on Dominus or Acastus class Forge World Knights. First, we have Hammer Blow. This allows you to remain stationary and it buffs blast weapons. Just as standard, you get to reroll hit rolls of 1. But if you're targeting a unit with 6 units or more, you get to reroll all hits. Not bad, particularly stacked with blast weapons getting slightly more shots against those targets. Seems a bit pricey on something like a Dominus though at 3 CP. Perhaps best on a Crusader with a rocket pod and one of those relic blast weapons. Giving up movement is a little bit painful though. And honestly, I think that most of the time you're going to be better off moving. Next, for 2 or 3 CP, we have Horner in Violet. It gives you plus 1 strength to your ranged weapons if you've not advanced. Depending on what you're shooting at, this could be really quite good. If you know that you're going to be targeting a strength 7 vehicle, and you'll want your Avenger Gatling Cannon to make a lot more of a mark, then this could be good. It will require you to think about what you're targeting ahead of time, and of course not make use of Raven's Advance and Shoot ability. For 2 CP, I do think it's a bit on the pricey side though. Again, I suspect rarely used. Next, for 1 or 3 command points, we have Lockstep Advance. Again, you're sacrificing some movement, you half your movement, and again, it's a buff to Blast Weapons. For every blast weapon you fire, you roll one additional dice when it determining the number of shots and discard the worst result. Potentially could be stacked with hammer blow if you really wanted to make the absolute most of your blast weapons, but it's not really the biggest buff out there for one command point, particularly having to give up movement. Next we have Crimson War for 2 CP, and this one basically auto saves one attack, making the saving roll a 6 in close combat. If the enemy is AP minus 4 or better, then you'd likely not get a save anyway, so you wouldn't be able to use it. But say you did get hit by a really, really powerful AP-3 attack, this could be an interesting way to negate that save. You're going to have to weigh up whether or not it's worth it to save the wounds on your character. But some attacks in 40k these days do have absolutely ludicrous damage. If you got hit by something that's D3 plus 3 damage, then this could be a decent shout. Next we have Shadow's Reach for 2 CP, which is perhaps one of the most interesting stratagems out of them. You use this at the start of your opponent's turn, and suddenly your knight gets 3 inch engagement range rather than just 1. Say if you charged a knight in your last turn, got it somewhere in the middle of your opponent's army, but not in melee with a whole bunch of fighter units, this could be incredibly disruptive, 
as suddenly a lot of the enemy army will find itself in combat with the knight. It means they might not be able to shoot at other targets and might need to fall back if they wanted to move, which could stop them from charging. This one could be really potentially devastating, particularly with how big Imperial Knight's bases can be and how many units this could affect. I bear in mind that you can't use this one on Armager class knights, so you can't use them to be maximum disruption units, but still though, in the right situation, this could be very good indeed. If it's the difference between a massive enemy getting to shoot or not, then 2 CP could be well invested. Next we have 3 CP for Colossi Eternal. This one kind of gives you rotate ion shields on 3 other knights, provided they're both within 3 inches of 1 knight. It's 3 CP for them all to get a 4 plus invul save, which say if you had 3 Questorus classes walking down the board, that could be worth it, so it means that any knight that your opponent targets, they're still going to be met by the same indomitable barrier of invul. It does require you to bunch up your knights a bit, which might not be the best in an already elite army, but just to mitigate some major damage on turn 1 or turn 2, this could be really quite intimidating. I don't think it's quite as good value as rotate ion shields, but it could be nice to have the option if you plan around it. Next we have Horrors at Bay, which is quite similar to one of the Dark Angel stratagems that we saw recently, and it's basically an annoying one to mess with enemy engagement range, meaning that if you actually want to attack the knight in close combat, you do actually need to be in engagement range, you can't just be within half an inch of a model that's within half an inch of the enemy. Kind of an anti-horde one for the most part, unless you've got an elite unit that's really struggled to get into contact with the knight. If it does make the difference between some scary models getting to attack the knight or not, this is one CP amazingly well spent. Finally, to help protect a knight that has charged in, we have Rolling Thunder. This one's minus one to hit if you're within three inches of a non armager knight that charged. Pretty nice if you are charging something, and you're pretty sure that you're not going to be able to kill whatever scary melee unit that you were in combat with. Again, quite a nice one that you can weigh up on a case-by-case -case basis. So overall, I think there's really quite a lot of powerful options for House Raven here. For me, the main strength of it lies in some of the relics, particularly that very nice Fury of the Keep Thermal Cannon and Relentless Wrath Battle Cannon. I'm a bit less enthused by the damage buff stratagems, but with some really annoying little tricks such as Horrors at Bay and Shadow's Reach, they've most certainly strengthened this household by quite a bit. So, hope you've enjoyed the review of these formations. As I said, I'll be hoping to try and get one out for the Death Guard and the Cult of Strife as soon as I can. I'm afraid just because I've been very busy today, I'm not sure whether that will happen today, or whether it might have to wait till tomorrow, unfortunately. In any case though, if you would like to see more, feel free to subscribe to Allspec's Tactics, or just check back later for future videos. If you've enjoyed the video, I would just like to mention that I do have a Patreon page, which you can find links down in the video description. If you have been enjoying regularly, any support is massively appreciated, these videos do take a fair amount of time to make, and Patreon support is what gives me the time to keep on doing this. Channel backers do get a fair few advantages, such as seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the prize giveaways with the chance to win some really big model kits. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.